Hi and welcome to Simcha, a celebration of life. I'm your host, Aaron Halevi. The cooking tradition of Jews of Spanish and Mediterranean descent, or Sephardim, has always been one of diverse, spicy, yet healthy eating. Today on Cooking with Suiza, Debbie whips up a quick and easy fish dish with a delicious and fragrant mixed spice called za'atar. Every time I go to Israel, I have a special place that I visit. This is a little store in Machane Yehuda, which is the market in Jerusalem that sells the most unbelievable spices. One of my favorite, favorite spices, in fact it's not a spice, it is a herb, is called za'atar. Za'atar is a herb that is made up of thyme, hyssop, oreganum and sesame seeds. It's actually quite phenomenal that this herb actually dates back all the way to our Torah. In the Torah, this herb is called Ezov and is mentioned a few times. It is mentioned when the Torah speaks in Leviticus about purifying the red heifer, that this herb was used in purification rituals. It is also mentioned at the time of the Exodus when the Jews were about to leave Egypt and when they put blood on their doorposts, they actually mixed Ezov, known as Zata, with the blood. King David also speaks of this when he speaks of purifying and cleansing his body, where he asks for Zata to be mixed with olive oil to be rubbed into his body. So today I am going to be using this wonderful, wonderful herb called Zata to make a fish dish. For this dish, you will need some fresh fish. I have used angel fish, but you can use any fish that is your preference. Then we have the za'atar, some olive oil, some salt, and some crushed garlic. This is a very simple dish to do. All you do is you take your za'atar and you put it into a separate bowl with a little bit of salt, some of your garlic, depending on your preference of how much garlic you would like to use. And then you take your olive oil and you pour it in slowly mixing until you have a paste. What is really nice about this paste actually is that you can use it as it is, just like this, with your challah on a Friday night. You can put some on top of your hummus. And in actual fact, what I do is when I bake my challah for Friday night, I put just plain zaata on top of my challahs. Instead of using sesame seeds or poppy seeds, I just put plain zaata and it is absolutely delicious. You can also put some into your challah. It's got such an aromatic smell and taste, it is beautiful. And then all you do is you take your mixture and you pour it over your fish fillets. and just spread it around to make sure that all your fish is covered in the za'ata. Once all the fish is covered in the za'ata and oil mixture, we can now bake it in the oven on 180 degrees for probably about 20 minutes. It doesn't take long to cook. A wonderful accompaniment to the fish is in actual fact cabbage. You can make potatoes, you can make rice, you can do whatever you want with it, but cabbage just brings out the flavor of the hyssop and it's, it's such a wonderful infusion together. So we use some shredded cabbage, diced onions, some coriander, turmeric for a bit of color, some salt and some olive oil for frying. So we take a nice heavy frying pan and we put our olive oil into the frying pan. You don't need very much, it's just to cover the bottom of the pan. And then we put our onions in first. The onions take longer than the cabbage to fry, so we put them in first and we just want to get them a bit brown. 
once the onions start becoming quite brown, you actually take your spices and mix them in at this time. This actually roasts the spices and brings out their flavor and it also infuses with the onion. And you can just mix it out a bit. Brings out a beautiful golden color and a stunning smell. And then we take our cabbage and we put it into our pan. It looks like a lot of cabbage here, but when cabbage cooks, it actually loses a lot of its weight. So you can also just put it in in batches so that it doesn't overflow out of the pan. And we just mix it all together and let the cabbage simmer with the spices and the onion. Once the cabbage is starting to simmer and to change color, you can now put a little bit of salt in and mix it all together. You don't want to overcook your cabbage. You just still want it a little bit crunchy. So you just wait for it to change color. Remember that your onions are actually cooked. And in actual fact, you can add whatever spices or herbs that you want to the cabbage. Our fish and our cabbage are now cooked and ready to be served. So you just can dish up some cabbage onto a plate. And then you take your fish fillets and place them on top of the cabbage. Now I did mention that this herb zaita comes from Israel, but it is available at your local supermarket where the Moroccan and Indian spices are. And then if you like, you can just drizzle a little bit of lemon juice over the fish and it is ready to be eaten. Welcome back. For the past 32 years, Rabbi Laban Wolf has been a spiritual mentor and worldwide teacher of the mystical side of Judaism. as Hamas. He uses the Kabbalistic texts on a recent trip to Jahannam to gain a better understanding. Currently viewed as a uh, ancient cryptic Jewish wisdom was uh, not available, available to the masses. It retreat for the majority in more recent times, specifically from the century onwards with the rise of uh, Hasidism and spe specifically Chabad Hasidism, it's become explicated. But the way it's become explicated is to make it practical. In other words, to take the depths in life in order to be able to make them meaningful at a point in history where we really need to have much more profundity to cope with the kind of social and personal stresses that the world now is undergoing. In my particular instance, I've taken the teachings and what I've tried to do is to allow them to inform us of our personal nature, self-understanding for the purposes of personal growth. I personally take a behavioral approach, which means that I'm not particularly interested as a psychologist in terms of what formative childhood influences make us the way we are today. Now, I'm sure there are many but I think they're also fraught with speculation. And you can spend years and years on the uh, proverbial couch of a psychiatrist and still 10 years later not be quite sure. And if you are, it may not even be accurate. So I really moved to the posture of, don't worry about what happened yesterday, but rather adopt tomorrow a much better stance in life, behaviorally. And here comes a very important Kabbalistic teaching, which is, we change ourselves from the outside in as powerfully as from the inside out. What I mean is 
what we do with our bodies, what we do with our words, begins to shape and influence our inner behavioral habitual mode. So what I do is I explain the nature of the mind from a Kabbalistic perspective, specifically the Hasidic teachings of the three phases of mind consciousness, and then the seven phases of emotion consciousness, and I teach people now how to put it back together so that they move their bodies, so that they move their lips and are able to generate a much better approach to perception of reality. I guess that's in a nutshell the term I've coined behavioural Kabbalah. When we speak about the three phases of mind, what we're talking about first phase is how do you give birth to a thought? How does a thought jump into the consciousness. Did it come from nowhere? Of course it didn't come from nowhere. And also there's a process. So I explained that we all go fishing in the pond of our subconsciousness. And each one of us has our own individual fishing style. We go fishing in an area of the pond where we feel personally safe. Um, we actually look for certain kinds of fish that appeals to our personality traits so to speak. We choose our own fishing line and in so doing we create our conjuring up of the thought and it continues as part of our personality nature. So for example people repeat that process over and over again. The boss comes in, gives that instruction and I immediately feel a sense of fear or inadequacy every morning. So that becomes my default thought process of what jumps into my consciousness. So that's phase one, and we call that chokhmah, the process of giving birth to a thought. Then there's phase two. Phase two is the thought is there. Now what am I going to do with it? There is a natural intellectual process, and that is that you take the point source of the thought and you develop it. That's called the process of understanding, mental exploration, looking at it through its length and breadth, analysis. That's called Bina. And then there's a third phase. And the third phase is focusing. Where's that thought going? For what purpose? What is its end? What is the result we wish to achieve? And so that shapes the flow of understanding in such a way that it reaches that goal. That third phase is called Da'as. Now, of course, I'm talking about cogent intellectual process. We're talking about a lineal development because I am a reasonable individual. So I take all these three and allow them to balance in order to reach an end. Often, we just simply fall short somewhere in the middle. E.g., I'm in the kitchen and I go to the dining room because I remember I have to get something. Then in the dining room, I stop in my tracks because I've forgotten why I enter the dining room. Now, has that happened to you? That's good, that reassures me, it happens to me often. So what is that all about? I had chokhmah, the spark, the thought, because I needed to get something. I had a level of bina development, I therefore moved my body and walked into the dining room. But before I completed the process with da'as, I lost the chachma. The original spark thought got lost, so to speak. The fish jumped back in the water. As a consequence, I just stood there. And what did I do? I went back in terms of rethinking, or I physically went back to the kitchen, and there it popped back into my head, and I followed through. That's just a simplistic example of the process involved here. In order to make this a conscious process which is reasonable and services my needs as a human being walking through life, it requires a certain degree of training. Of course, if we follow naturally with our training, we usually move through those three processes and fairly articulately. However, if we want to excel, if we want to develop ourselves to a point where our mind processes are something of a higher order, then we need to go through some sort of training program. I've developed a program called Kavana Mindfulness. What that means is I take those three phases and I teach meditatively how to actually make each phase a much more 
developed process of the mind where I have levels of control and I'm able to, able to do this at a much higher level of operation. Now, I can't describe in this moment what the content of that program consists of, but you can well understand that if you can meditate and introspect through meditation and observe the processes, whether you develop a visual which is artificial or a visual which is closer to reality, doesn't matter. But if you have a model and then you practice it over and over again, you can actually evolve each of these three phases to something very, very superior. And it's all within our capacity. It's not awfully difficult either. The Jewish month of Cheshvan begins the extended time span between the festival Sukkot and the next major festival, Pesach or Passover. In the meantime, the spiritual seeds planted during the busy Jewish month of Tishrei begin to take root, to be watered and to grow, finally appearing and bearing fruit during Pesach in the month of Nisan. Sarah Evian once again explores the significance of this month. So we learn about the Jewish months and the energy that each one contains. The letter through, it, through which it is created, the, the tribe, the breaststone, and the sense through which we heal and which the month carries. So this is the month of Cheshvan. It is the month straight after Tishrei. And Tishrei was filled with this unbelievably intense energy. Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur and Sukkot, it was unbelievably full. And we took from that everything that we could. And now we enter the month of Cheshvan, and Cheshvan is the only month in the whole Jewish calendar that has no special days to it. Every month in the Jewish calendar has something, whether it's Hanukkah or Rosh Hashanah or Shavuot or Purim or counting the Omer, everyone's got something, but Cheshvan doesn't have anything to it. And this teaches us that we have to take the inspiration that comes from the month of Tishrei, and we have to bring it down into our ordinary lives. This is a very important lesson for us to learn because we spend so much of our lives looking for inspiration. We're running, always looking for inspiration, and we get inspired, but then what happens to that inspiration? More often than not, it just dissipates. And Cheshvan is a month for us where we learn to take this inspiration that we got, the envelope that was filled with the life energy of the whole year, and we are able to bring it down day by day into our ordinary lives. It is like when you're preparing for a wedding, this is the highlight of your life. You spend so much time and money and effort making the wedding a beautiful time, and all your family are coming, and it's just gonna be the most special time of your lives but actually it's a drop in the ocean of what your whole life is. And the purpose of the wedding, in a sense, is to take that closeness that you have with your family and the beauty of the wedding and the closeness that you all felt and bring that into your everyday life in your relationships with those people. There's a beautiful Kabbalistic concept which is called Ratzo Vashuv. It literally means running, and returning. And what this means in Kabbalah is that we have two energies within us, two forces within us. We have a desire to reach out of ourselves for something greater than ourselves, because if we're only surrounded with ourselves, that's a pretty narrow perspective and a narrow life that we have. It is only through connecting to something greater than ourselves that we can expand ourselves. So the energy of ratso, of rushing or running out of ourselves is about running for inspiration and looking for places of inspiration. And the whole month of Tishrei was this. It was an inspired month almost every single day. But we can't live in the space of inspiration and of ratso because we're not functioning, we're not effective 
And there's no purpose for us to be in this world if we are always running to be out of it. The main purpose of the Ratzel, of the gaining inspiration, is it to bring it down and settle. Shuv means to settle, to be. And so we, Cheshvan is a month of taking all the inspiration of Tishrei and bringing it down into the everyday. Finding those inspiring moments that we gained and making our lives in Cheshvan more meaningful, more inspired and more full of purpose. It's about going out in the world and building the world, making this world a better place. The letter for Cheshvan is a nun, and a nun is 50. The final letter nun is a straight line going down, right below the central line, going down. It's like a root. And that's what Cheshvan is. It's taking ourselves, rooting ourselves into a specific point of deep being. And from there, going out into the world, having heard our inspired unique soul voice in Elul and in Tishrei, and in now spreading our roots outwards. But a root has one specific point from where the other roots come, and that specific point is who we became and who we are, and how we're going to put ourselves out into the world from here. The sense of Cheshvan is smell, and really this month, Go out and fill your senses with smell. Smell the, the frangipanis and smell the jasmine and make yourself full with a beautiful fragrance, with a nectar of what this earth holds. Smell is the one sense that is not so tangible. Sight and hearing and touch and taste are all very tangible senses but the smell is not so tangible. And it has within it the residue of, of heaven, of the unity and the intimacy that we experienced in Tishrei. You know, when we make Haftalah after Shabbat on a Saturday night, we smell things to remind us of the scent of heaven. And that is what Cheshvan is. We smelling to remember the amazing intensity and unity that we experienced in the month of Tishrei. Smell is also our most spiritual sense, and it is the one that connects us mostly with our soul because it is not so tangible. So I bless us this month as we go out into the ordinary days of being, that our days are filled, filled with constructing and building and being in the world, really making the world a better place allowing ourselves to settle, to shuv from the ratzor, from the inspiration that we gained in Tishrei and filling our world with uniqueness and allowing our potential. In chapter six of Ethics of Our Fathers, Rabbi Shimon, the son of Judah, is quoted as saying, in the name of Rabbi Shimon, the son of Yochai. Beauty, strength, wealth, honor, wisdom, sageness, old age and children are becoming to the righteous and becoming to the world. As is stated in Proverbs 16.31, ripe old age is a crown of beauty to be found in the ways of righteousness. That's all we have for this week's episode of Semcha, a celebration of life. As always, we'd love to hear from you, so please send us a message on Facebook at Spirit Sister Productions. From me, Aaron Halevi, and the Simcha team, have a great week.